Okay. I uh, believe we have sound. I sure hope we have sound. Uh, and uh, this is The Plague, uh, Part 2, Episode 6. We left off at the top of page 121, and we continue apace. And, as it so happens, what is yet to be re recorded before coming to the culmination, during the period when the plague was gathering all its forces to fling at them at the town and lay it waste, is the long, heart-rendingly monotonous struggle to put, up, put up by some obstinate people like Rambert to recover their lost happiness and to balk the plague of that part of themselves which they were ready to defend in the last ditch. This was their way of resisting the bondage closing in upon them, and while their resistance lacked the active virtues of the other, it had, to the narrator's thinking, its point, and moreover it bore witness, even in its futility and incoherences, to a salutary pride. Rambert fought to prevent the plague from besting him. Once assured that there was no way of getting out of the town by lawful methods, he decided, as he told Via, to have recourse to others. He began by sounding café waiters. A waiter usually knows much of what's going on behind the scenes. But the first he spoke to knew only of the very heavy penalties imposed on such attempts at evasion. In one of the cafés he visited, he was actually taken for a stool pigeon and curtly sent about his business. It was not until he happened to meet Cotard at Ria's place that he made a little headway. On that day, he and Ria had been talking again about his unsuccessful efforts to interest the authorities in his case, and Cotard heard him the tail end of the conversation. Some days later, Cotard met him in the street and greeted him with a hail-fellow-well-met manner that he now used on all occasions. Hello, Rambert! Still no luck? None, whatever. It's no good counting on the red tape merchants. They couldn't understand if they tried. I know that, and I'm trying to find some other way, but it's damn difficult. Yes, Cotard replied, it certainly is. He, however, knew a way to go about it, and he explained to Rambert, who was much surprised to learn this, that for the some time past he had been going the rounds of the cafes and had made a number of acquaintance, acquaintances and had learned of the existence of an organization handling this sort of business. The truth was that Cotard, who had been beginning to live above his means, was now involved in smuggling ventures concerned with ration goods. Selling contraband cigarettes and inferior liquor at steadily rising prices, he was on the way to building up a small fortune. Are you quite sure of this? Rambert asked. Quite. I had a proposal of the sort made to me the other day. But you didn't accept it? Oh, come, there's no need to be suspicious. Cotard's tone was genial. I didn't accept it because personally I have no wish to leave. I've, I have my reasons. After a short silence, he added, You don't ask me what my reasons are, I notice. I take it, Rambert replied, that they're none of my business. That's so, in a way, of course, but from another angle. Well, let's put it like this. I've been feeling much more at ease here since the plague settled in. Rambert made no comment. Then he asked, And how does one approach this organization, as you call it? Ah, Cotard replied, That's none too easy. Come with me. It was four in the afternoon. The town was warming up to the boiling point under a sultry sky. Nobody was about... All shops were shuttered. Cotard and Rambert walked some distance without speaking under the arcades. This was an hour of the day when the plague lay low, so to speak. The silence, the extinction of all color and movement might have been due as much to the fierce sunlight as to the epidemic, and there was no telling if the air was heavy with menace or merely with dust and heat. You had to look closely and take thought to realize that plague was here, for it portrayed its presence only by negative signs. Thus Cotard, who had affinities with it, drew Rambert's attention to the absence of the dogs that in normal times would have been seen sprawling in the shadow of the doorways, panting, trying to find a non-existent patch of coolness. They went along the Boulevard de Palmier, crossed the Place d'Armes, and then turned down toward the docks. On the left was a café painted green with a wide awning of coarse yellow canvas projecting over the sidewalk. Cotard and Rambert wiped their brows on entering. There were some small iron tables, also painted green, and folding chairs. The room was empty, the air humming with flies. In a yellow cage on the bar, a parrot squatted on its perch, all its feathers drooping. Some old pictures of military scenes covered with grime and cobwebs adorned the walls. On the tables, including that at which Rambert was sitting, bird droppings were drying, and he was puzzled whence they came until, after some wing flappings, a handsome cock came hopping out of its retreat in a dark corner. Just then the heat seemed to rise several degrees more. Cotard took off his coat and banged on the tabletop. A very small man wearing a long blue apron that came nearly to his neck emerged from a doorway at the back. 
shouted a greeting to Cotard, and, vigorously kicking the cock out of his way, came up to the table. Raising his voice to drown the cock's indignant cacklings, he asked what the gentleman would like. Cotard ordered white wine and asked, Where's Garcia? The dwarf replied that he hadn't shown up at the cafe for several days. Think he'll come this evening? Well, I ain't in his secrets, but you know when he usually comes, don't you? Yes, really, it's nothing very urgent. I only want him to know this friend of mine. The barkeeper rubbed his moist hands on the front of his apron. Ah, so this gentleman's in business too? Yes, Cotard said. The man made a snuffling noise. All right, come back this evening. I'll send the kid to warn him. After they had left, Rambert asked what the business in question might be. Why, smuggling, of course. They get the stuff and pass through sentries at the gates. There's plenty of money in it. I see, Rambert asked for, paused for a moment, then asked, And I take it they friends in court? You've said it. In the evening, the awning was all was rolled up, the parrot squawking in its cage, and the small tables were surrounded by men in their shirt sleeves. When Cotard entered, one man with a white shirt gaping on a brick-red chest and straw hat planted well back on his head rose to his feet. He had a sun-tanned face, regular features, small black eyes, very white teeth, and two or three rings on his fingers. He looked about thirty. Hi, he said to Cotard, ignoring Rambert. Let's have one at the bar. They drank three rounds in silence. What about a stroll, Garcia suggested. They walked toward the harbor. Garcia asked what he was, what he wanted to do. Cotard explained that it wasn't really for a deal that he wanted to introduce his friend, Monsieur Rambert, but only for what he called a getaway. Puffing out his cigarette, Garcia walked straight ahead. He asked some questions, always referring to Rambert as he, and appearing not to notice his presence. Why does he want to go? His wife is in France. Ah, after a short pause, he added, what's his job? He's a journalist. Is he now? Journalists have long tongues. I told you, he's a friend of mine, Cotard replied. They walked on in silence until they were near the wharves, which were now railed off. Then they turned in the direction of a small tavern from which came a smell of fried sardines. In any case, Garcia said finally, it's not up my alley. Raoul's your man, and I'll have to get in touch with him. It's none too easy. That so? Cotard sounded interested. He's lying low, is he? Garcia made no answer. At the door of the tavern, he halted and for the first time addressed Rambert directly. The day after tomorrow, at eleven, at the corner of the customs barracks in the upper town. He made as if to go, and then seemed to have an afterthought. It's going to cost something, you know. He made the observation in quite casual tone. Rambert nodded, naturally. On the way back, the journalist thanked Cotard. Don't mention it, old chap. I'm only too glad to help you. And then, you're a journalist. I dare say you'll put in a word for me one day or another. Two days later, Rambert and Cotard climbed the wide, shadeless street leading to the upper part of the town. The barracks were occupied by the customs officers and had been partly transformed into a, into a hospital, and a number of people were standing outside the main entrance, some of them hoping to be allowed to visit a patient. A futile hope, since such visits were strictly prohibited. Others to glean some news of an invalid, news that in the course of an hour would have ceased to count. For these reasons, there were always a number of people and a certain amount of movement at this spot, a fact that probably accounted for its choice by Garcia for its meeting with Rambert. It puzzles me, Cotard remarked, why you're so keen on going. Really, nothing's, really, what's happening here is extremely interesting. Not to me, Rambert replied. Well, yes, one's running some risks, I grant you. All the same, when you come to think of it, one ran quite as much a risk in the old days of crossing a busy street. Just then, Ria's car drew up level with them. Taru was at the wheel, and Ria seemed half asleep. He roused himself to make the introductions. We know each other, Taru said. We're at the same hotel. He then offered to drive Rambert back to the center. No, thanks. We've an appointment here. Ria looked hard at Rambert. Yes, Rambert? What's that? Cotard sounded surprised. The doctor knows about it? There's the magistrate. Taru gave Cotard a warning glance. Cotard's look changed. Monsieur Oton was striding down the street toward them, briskly, yet with dignity. He took off his hat as he came up with them. Good morning, Monsieur Oton, said Taru. The magistrate returned the greeting of the men in the car, and, turning to Rambert and Cotard, who were in the background, gave them a quiet nod. Taru introduced Cotard and the journalist. The magistrate gazed at the sky for a moment, sighed, and remarked that these were indeed sad times. I've been told, Monsieur Taru, he continued, that you are helping to enforce the prophylactic measures. I need hardly say how commendable that is. A fine example. Do you think, Dr. Ria, that the epidemic will get worse? Rio replied that one could only hope it wouldn't, and the magistrate replied that it, one must never lose hope. The ways of providence were inscrutable. 
Tarou asked if his work had increased as the result of present conditions. Quite the contrary. Criminal cases, what we call the first instance, are growing rarer. In fact, almost my only work just now is holding inquiries into the more serious breaches of the new regulations. Our ordinary laws have never been so well respected. That's because, by contrast, they necessarily appear good ones, Tarou observed. The magistrate, who seemed unable to take his gaze off the sky, dro abruptly dropped his mildly meditative air and stared at Tarou. What does that matter? It's not the law that counts, it's the sentence. And that is something we must all accept. That fellow, said Tarou when the magistrate was out of hearing, is enemy num number one. He pressed the starter. Some minutes later, Rambert and Cotar saw Garcia approaching. Without making any sign of recognition, he came straight up to them and by way of greeting said, You'll have to wait a bit. There was a complete silence in the crowd around them, most of whom were women. Nearly all were carrying parcels. They had had the vain hope of somehow smuggling these in to their sick relatives and the even crazier idea that the latter could eat the food they'd brought. The gate was guarded by armed sentries, and now and then an eerie cry resounded in the courtyard between the barrack rooms and the entrance. Whenever this happened, anxious eyes turned toward the sick wards. The three men were watching the scene when a brisk, good morning from behind them made them swing round. In spite of the heat, Raoul was wearing a well-cut dark suit and felt hat with a rolled-up brim. He was tall and strongly built, his face rather pale. Hardly moving his lips, he said quickly and clearly, Let's walk down to the center. You, Garcia, needn't come. Garcia lit a cigarette and remained there while they walked away. Placing himself between Rambert and Cotard, Raoul set the pace, a fast one. Garcia's explained the situation, he said. We can fix it, but I must warn you it'll cost you cool 10000 Rambert said he agreed to these terms. Lunch with me tomorrow at the Spanish restaurant near the docks. Rambert said, right, and Raoul shook his hand, smiling for the first time. After he had gone, Cotard said he wouldn't be able to come to lunch the next day as he had an engagement, but anyhow, Rambert didn't need him anymore. When next day Rambert entered the Spanish restaurant, everyone turned and stared at him. The dark, cellar-like room below the level of the small yellow street was patronized only by men, mostly Spaniards, judging by their looks. Raoul was sitting at a table at the back of the room. Once he had beckoned to the journalist and, and Rambert started to go toward him, the curiosity left the faces of others and they bent over their plates again. Raoul had beside him a tall, thin, ill-shaven man with enormously wide shoulders, an equine face, and thinning hair. His shirt sleeves were rolled up, displaying long, skinny arms covered with black hair. When Rambert was introduced, he gave three slow nods. His own name, however, was not announced, and Raoul, when referring to him, always said, Our friend. Our friend here thinks he may be able to help you. He is going, Raoul broke off, as the waitress had just come to take Rambert's order. He is going to put you in touch with two of our friends who will introduce you to some sentries who we've squared. But that doesn't mean you can start right away. You'll have to leave it to the sentries to decide on the best moment. The simplest thing will be for you to stay some nights with one of them. His home is quite near the gate. The first thing is for our friend here to give you the contacts needed. Then when everything's set, you'll settle with him for the expenses. Again, the friend slowly moved his equine head up and down without ceasing to munch the tomato and pimento salad he was shoveling into his mouth after which he began to speak speak with a slight Spanish accent. He asked Rambert to meet him the next day but one at eight in the morning in the cathedral porch. Another two days' wait, Rambert observed. It ain't so easy as all that, you'll see, Raoul said. Them boys take some finding. Horseface nodded slow approval once more. Some time was spent looking for a subject of conversation. The problem was solved easily enough when Rambert discovered that Horseface was an ardent football player. He, too, had been very keen on soccer. They discussed the French championship, the merits of professional English teams, and the technique of passing. By the end of the meal, Horseface was in high good humor and was calling Rambert old boy and trying to convince him that the most sporting position by far on the football field was that of center half. You see, old boy, it's the center half that does the placing, and that's the whole art of the game, isn't it? Rambert was inclined to agree, though he personally had always played center forward. The discussion proceeded peacefully until a radio was turned on, and after at first emitting a series of sentimental songs, broke into it the announcement that there had been 137 plague deaths on the previous day. No one present, present betrayed the least emotion. Horseface merely shrugged and stood up. Raoul and Rambert followed his, examples, uh, his example. As they were going out, the center half shook Rambert's hand, hand vigorously. My name's Gonzales, he said. 
To Rambert, the next two days seemed endless. He looked up Ryu and described to him the latest developments, and then accompanied the doctor on one of his calls. He took leave of him on the doorstep of a house where a patient, suspected to have plague, was awaiting him. There was a sound of footsteps and voices in the hall. The family were being warned of the doctor's visit. I hope Taru will be on time. Ry- I hope Taru will be on time. Ryu murmured. He looked worn out. Is the epidemic getting out of hand? Rambert asked. Ryu said it wasn't that. Indeed, the death graph was rising less steeply. Only they lacked adequate means of coping with the disease. We're short of equipment. In all the armies of the world, the shortage of equipment is usually compensated for by manpower. But we're short of manpower too. Haven't doctors and trained assistants been sent from other towns? Yes, Ryu said. Ten doctors and a hundred helpers. That sounds a lot, no doubt, but it's barely enough to cope with the present state of affairs, and it'll be quite inadequate if things get worse. Rambert, who had been listening to the sounds within the house, turned to Ryu with a friendly smile. Yes, he said, you better make haste to win your battle. Then a shadow crossed his face. You know, he added in a low tone, it is not because of that I'm leaving. Ryu replied that he knew it very well, and Rambert, Rambert went on to say, I don't think I'm a coward, not as a rule anyhow, and I've had opportunities of putting to the test. Only, are there some, th- only there are some thoughts I simply cannot endure. The doctor looked him in the eyes. You'll see her again, he said. Maybe, but, but I just can't stomach the thought that it may last on and on, and all the time she'll be growing older. At 30, one's beginning to age, and one's got to squeeze all one can out of life. Uh, but I doubt if you can understand. Ryu was replying that he thought he could when Taru came up, obviously much excited. I've just asked Panalu to join us. Well, asked the doctor. He thought it over, and he said yes. That's good, the doctor said. I'm glad to know he's better than his sermon. Most people are like that, Taru replied. It's only a matter of giving them the chance. He smiled and winked at Ria. That's my job in life, giving people chances. Excuse me, Rambert said. I've got to be off. On Thursday, the day of the appointment, Rambert entered the cathedral porch at five minutes to eight. The air was still relatively cool. Small, fleecy clouds, which presently the sun would swallow at a gulp, were drifting across the sky. A faint smell of moisture rose from the lawns, parched though they were. Still masked by the eastward houses, the sun was warming up Joan of Arc's helmet only, and it made a solitary patch of brightness brightness in the cathedral square. A clock struck eight. Rambert took some steps in the empty porch. From inside came a low sound of intoning voices, together with stale wafts of incense and dank air. Then the voices ceased. Ten small black forms came out of the building and hastened away toward the center of town. Rambert grew impatient. Other black forms climbed the steps and entered the porch. He was about to light a cigarette when it struck him that smoking might be frowned on here. At 8.15, the organ began to play very softly. Rambert entered. At first, he could see nothing in the dim light of the aisle. After a moment, he made out in the nave the small black forms that had preceded him. They were all grouped in a corner in front of a makeshift altar on which stood a statue of San Roche, carved in haste by one of our local sculptors. Kneeling, they looked even smaller than before, blobs of clotted darkness hardly more opaque than the gray, smoky haze in which they seemed to float. Above them, the organ was playing endless variations. When Rambert stepped out of the cathedral, he saw Gonzales already going down the steps on his way to the back to the town. I thought you'd clear it off, old boy, he said to the journalist, considering how late it is. He proceeded, he proceeded to explain that he'd gone to meet his friends at the place agreed upon, which was quite nearby, at ten to eight, the time they'd fixed, and waited twenty minutes without seeing them. Something must have held them up. There's lots of snags, you know, in our line of business. He suggested another meeting at the same time on the following day beside the war memorial. Cranbert sighed and pushed his hat back on his head. Don't take it so hard, Gonzalez said. Why, think of all the swerves and runs and passes you got to, you got to make to score a goal. Quite so, Rambert agreed, but the game lasts only an hour and a half. The war memorial at Iran stands at one place where one has a glimpse of the sea, a sort of esplanade followed for a short distance by the brow of the cliff overlooking the harbor. Next day, being again the first to arrive at the meeting place, Rambert whiled away the time reading the list of names of those who had died for their country. Some minutes later, two men strolled up, gave him a casual glance, then resting their elbows on the parapet of the esplanade, gazed intently down at the empty, lifeless harbor. Both wore short-sleeved jerseys and blue trousers and were of much the same height. The journalists moved away and, seated on a stone bench, studied their appearance at leisure. They were obviously youngsters, not more than twenty. Just then he saw Gonzales coming up. Those are our friends, he said, after apologizing for being late. Then he led Rambert, Rambert to the two youths, whom he introduced as Marcel and Louis. They looked so much alike that Rambert had no doubt they were brothers. 
Right, said Gonzalez. Now you know each other, you can get down to business. Marcel, or Louis, said that their turn of guard duty began in two days and lasted a week. They'd have to watch out for the night when there was the best chance of bringing it off. The trouble was there were two other sentries, regular soldiers beside themselves at the west gate. These two men had better be kept out of the business. One couldn't depend on them, and anyhow, it would pile up expenses unnecessarily. Some evenings, however, these two sentries spent several hours in the back room of a nearby bar. Marcel or Louis said the best thing Rambert could do would be to stay at their place, which was only a few minutes' walk from the gate, and wait till one of them came to tell to tell him the coast was clear. It should then be quite easy for him to make his getaway. But there was no time to lose. There had been talk about setting up a duplicate sentry post a little farther out. Rambert agreed and handed some of his few remaining cigarettes to the young man. The one who had not spoken yet asked Gonzalez if the question of expenses had been settled and whether an advance would be given. No, Gonzalez said, and you needn't bother about that. He's a pal of mine. He'll pay when he leaves. Another meeting was arranged. Gonzalez su- suggested their dining together on the next day, but one at the Spanish restaurant. It was at easy walking distance from where the young men lived. For the first night, he added, I'll keep you company, old boy. Next day on his way to his bedroom, Rambert met Tahu coming down the stairs at the hotel. Like to come with me, he asked. I'm just off to see Rieu. Rambert hesitated. Well, I never feel sure I'm not disturbing him. I don't think you need to worry about that. He's talked about you quite a bit. The journalist pondered. Then, look here, he said. If you have any time to spare after dinner, never mind how late. Why not come to the hotel, both of you, and have a drink with me? Well, that will depend on Rieu. Taru sounded doubtful. And on the plague, said Taru. At 11 o'clock that night, however, Ria and Taru entered the small, small, narrow bar of the hotel. Some 30 people were crowded into it, all talking at the top of their voices. Coming from the silence of the plague-bound town, the two newcomers were startled by the sudden burst of noise and halted in the doorway. They understood the reason for it when they saw that liquor was still to be had here. Rambert, who was perched on a, s- on a stool at the corner of, th- of the bar, beckoned to them. With complete coolness, he elbowed away a noisy customer beside him to make room for his friends. You've no objection to a spot of something strong? No, Taru replied. Quite the contrary. Ria sniffed the pungency of bitter herbs in the drink that Rambert handed him. It was hard to make oneself heard in the din of voices, but Rambert seemed chiefly concerned with drinking. The doctor couldn't make up his mind whether he was drunk yet. At one of the two tables that occupied all the remaining space beyond the half circle around the bar, a naval officer with a girl on each side of him was describing to a fat, red-faced man a typhus epidemic at Cairo. They had camps, you know, he was saying, for the natives, with tents for the sick ones and a ring of sentries all round. If a member of the family came along and tried to smuggle in one of those damn fool native ren- remedies, they got fired at at sight. A bit tough, I grant you, but it was the only thing to do. At the other table, around which sat a bevy of bright young people, the talk was incomprehensible, half drowned by the stridents of St. Jean's Infirmary coming from a loudspeaker just above their heads. Any luck? Ria had to raise his voice. I'm getting on, Rambert replied, in the course of a week, perhaps. A pity, Taru shouted. Why? Oh, Ria put in. Taru said that because he thinks you might be useful to us here, but personally I understand your wish to get away only too well. Taru stood the next round of drinks. Rambert got off his stool and looked him in the eyes for the first time. How could I be useful? Why, of course, Taru replied, slowly reaching toward his glass. I'm one of our sanitary squads. The look of brooding obstinacy that Rambert so often had came back to his face, and he climbed again onto his stool. Don't you think these squads of ours do any good? asked Taru, who had just taken a sip of his glass and was gazing hard at Rambert. I'm sure they do, the journalist replied and drank off his glass. Ryu noticed that his hand was shaking, and he decided definitely that the man was far gone in drink. Next day, when for the second time Rambert entered the Spanish restaurant, he had to make his way through a group of men who had taken chairs out on the sidewalk and were sitting in the green-gold evening light, enjoying the first breaths of cooler air. They were smoking an acrid-smelling ta- uh, tobacco. The restaurant itself was almost empty. Rambert went to the table at the back, at which Gonzalez had sat when they met for the first time. He told the waitress he would wait a bit. It was 7.30. In twos and threes, the men from outside began to dribble and seat themselves at the table. The waitresses started serving them, and the tinkle of knives and forks, a hum of conversation, began to fill the cellar-like room. At eight, Rambert was waiting. The lights were turned on. A new set of people took over the other chairs at his table. He ordered dinner. At half past eight, he had finished without even without having seen either Gonzales or the two young men. He smoked several cigarettes. The restaurant was gradually emptying. 
Outside, night was falling rapidly. The curtains hung across the door were billowing in the warm breeze from the sea. At night, Rambert r- realized that the restaurant was quite uh, quite empty and the waitress was eyeing him p- curi- curiously. He paid, went out, and noticing that a cafe across the street was open, settled down there at a place from which he could keep an eye on the entrance of the restaurant. At half past nine, he walked slowly back to his hotel, racking his brains for some method of tracking down Gonzales, whose address he did not know, and bitterly discouraged by the not unlikely prospect of having to start the whole tiresome business all over again. It was at this moment, as he walked in the dark streets along which ambulances were speeding, that it suddenly struck him, as he informed Dr. Rio subsequently, that all this time he'd practically forgotten the woman he loved, so absorbed had he been in trying to find a rift in the walls that cut him off from her. But at this same moment, now that once more all ways of escape were sealed against him, he felt his longing for her blaze up again, with a violence so sudden, so intense, that he started running to his hotel, as if to escape the burning pain that nonetheless pervaded him, racing like wildflower in fire in his blood. Very early next day, however, he called on Rieu and to ask him where he could find Cotard. The only thing to do is to pick up the thread again where I dropped it. Come tomorrow night, Ria said. Taru asked me to invite Cotard here. I don't know why. He's due to come at ten. Come at half past ten. When Cotard visited the doctor the next day, Taru and Ria were discussing the case of one of Ria's patients, who against all expectations had recovered. It was ten to one against, Taru commented. He was in luck. Oh, come now, Cotard said. It can't have been the plague, that's all. They assured him there was no doubt it was a case of plague. That's impossible, since he recovered. You know as well as I do, once you have the plague, your number's up. True enough, as a general rule, Rio replied. But if you refuse to be beaten, you have some pleasant surprises. Cotard laughed. Precious few, anyhow. You saw the number of deaths this evening. Taru, who was gazing amiably at Cotard, said he knew the latest fingers and that the position was extremely serious. But what did that prove? Only that still more stringent measures should be applied. How? You can't make more stringent ones than those we have now. No, but every person in town must apply them to himself. Cotard stared at him in a, pl- in a puzzled manner, and Taru went on to say that there were far too many slackers, that this plague was everybody's business, and everyone should do his duty. For instance, any able-bodied man was welcome in the sanitary squads. That's an idea, said Cotard, but it won't get, won't get you anywhere. The plague has the whip hand of you, and there's nothing to be done about it. We shall know whether that is so, Taru's voice was carefully controlled, only when we've tried everything. Meanwhile, Rio had been sitting at his desk, copying out reports. Taru was still gazing at the little businessman who was stirring uneasily in his chair. Look here, Monsieur Cotard, why don't you join us? Picking up his derby hat, Cotard rose from his chair with an offended expression. It's not my job, he said. Then, with an air of bravado, he added, What's more, the plague suits me quite well, and I see no reason why I should bother about trying to stop it. As if a new idea had just waylaid him, Taru struck his board. Why, of course. I was forgetting. If it wasn't for that, you'd be arrested. Cotard gave a start and gripped the back of the chair as if he were about to fall. Rhea had stopped writing and was observing him with grave interest. Who told you that? Cotard almost screamed. Why, you yourself, Taru looked surprised. At least that's what the doctor and I have gathered from the way you speak. Losing all control of himself, Cotard let out a volley of oaths. Don't get excited, Taru said quietly. Neither I nor the doctor would dream of reporting you to the police. What you may have not done is no business of ours. And anyway, we've never had much use for the police. Come now, sit down again. Cotard looked at the chair and then hesitantly lowered himself onto it. He heaved, he heaved a deep sigh. It's something that happened ages ago, he began. Something they've dug up. I thought it had all been forgotten, but somebody started talking. Damn him! They sent for me and told me not to budge till the inquiry was finished and I felt they I felt pretty sure they'd end up by arresting me. Was it anything serious, Taru asked? Well that depends on what you by what you mean that depends on what you mean by serious. It wasn't murder anyhow. Prison or transportation with hard labor? Cotard was looking almost abject. Well, prison if I'm lucky. But after a moment he grew excited again. It was all a mistake. Everybody makes mistakes, and I can't bear the idea of being pulled in for that, of being torn from my house and habits and everyone I know. And that is the reason, Taru asked, why you had the bright idea of hanging yourself? Yes, it was a damn fool thing to do, I admit. For the first time, Rio spoke. He told Cotard that he quite understood his anxiety, but perhaps everything would come right in the end. Oh, for the moment, I have nothing to fear. I can see, Taru said, you're not going to join in our effort. 
twiddling his hat uneasily, Cotard gazed at Teru with shifty eyes. I hope you won't bear me a grudge. Certainly not, but, Teru smiled, do try at least not to propagate the microbe deliberately. Cotard protested he never wanted the plague. It was pure chance that it had broken out, and he wasn't to blame if it happened to make things easier for him just now. Then he seemed to pluck up courage again, and when Rambert entered, was shouting almost aggressively, What's more, I'm pretty sure you won't get anywhere. Rambert learned to his chagrin that Cotard didn't know where Gonzales lived. He suggested that they better pay another visit to the small cafe. They made an appointment for the following day. When Ryu gave him to understand that he'd like to be kept posted, Rambert proposed that he and Teru should look him up one night at the end of the week. They, should, they could come as late as they liked and would be sure to find him in his room. Next, ta- next morning, Cotard and Rambert went to the cafe and left a message for Garcia, asking him to come that evening, or if this could not be arranged, next day. They waited for him in vain that evening. The next day, Garcia turned up. He listened in silence to what Rambert had to say, then informed he had no idea what had happened, but knew that several districts of the town had been isolated for 24 hours for a house-to-house inspection. Quite possibly, Gonzalez and the two youngsters had been able to get through the cordon. All he could do was put them in touch once more with Raoul. Naturally, this couldn't be done before the next day but one. I see, Rambert said. I'll have to start it all over again, from scratch. On the next day but one, Raoul, who Rambert met at a street corner, confirmed Garcia's surmise. The low-lying districts had, in fact, been isolated in the cordon and put around them. The next thing was to get in contact with Gonzalez. Two days later, Rambert was lunching with the football, with footballer. It's too damn silly, Gonzalez said. Of course you should have arranged some way of seeing each other. Rambert heartily agreed. Tomorrow morning, Gonzalez continued, we'll look up the kids and try to get a real move on. When they called next day, however, the youngsters were out. A note was left fi- fixing a meeting on for the following day at noon outside the high school. When Ram- Rambert came back to his hotel, Teru was struck by the look on his face. Not feeling well? He asked. It's starting to ha- it's starting it's having to start it all over again that's got me down. Then he added, You'll come tonight, won't you? When the two friends entered Rambert's room later that night, they found him lying on the bed. He got up at once and filled the glasses he had ready. Before lifting his to his lips, Ryu, Ryu asked him if he was making progress. The journalist replied that he had started the same round again and got to the same point as before. In a day or two, he was to have his last appointment. Then he took a sip of his drink and added gloomily, Needless to say, they won't turn up. Oh, come, that doesn't follow just because they let you down last time. So you haven't understood yet, Rambert shrugged his shoulders almost scornfully. Understood what? The plague. Ah, Ryu exclaimed. No, you haven't understood that it means exactly that, the same thing over and over and over again. He went to a corner of the room and started a small phonograph. What's that record? Teru asked. I've heard it before. It's St. James Infirmary. When the phonograph was playing, two shots rang out in the distance. A dog or a getaway, Teru remarked. When a moment later, later the record ended, an ambulance bell could be heard clanging past on the window and receding into silence. Rather a boring record. Rambert remarked, and this must be the tenth time I've put it on today. Are you really so fond of it? No, but it's the only one I have. And after a moment, he added, and that's what I said it was, the same thing over and over again. He asked Ryu how many how the sanitary groups were functioning. Five teams were now at work, and it was hoped to form others. Sitting on the bed, the journalist seemed to be studying his fingernails. Ryu was gazing at his squat, powerfully built form, hunched up on the edge of the bed. Suddenly he realized that Rambert was returning his gaze. You know, doctor, I've given a lot of thought to your campaign, and if I'm not with you, I have my reasons. No, I don't think it's that I'm afraid to risk my skin again. I took part in the Spanish Civil War. On which side, Teru asked. The losing side. But since then, I've done a bit of thinking. About what? Courage. I I know now that man is capable of great deeds, but if he isn't capable of a great emotion, well, he leaves me cold. One has the idea that he is capable of everything, Teru remarked. I can't agree. He's incapable of suffering for a long time or being happy for a long time, which means that he's incapable of anything really worthwhile. He looked at the two men in turn and then asked, Tell me, Teru, are you capable of dying for love? Well, I couldn't say, but I hardly think so, as I am now. You see, but you're capable for di- of dying. F- you're capable of dying for an idea. One can see that right away. Well, personally, I've seen enough of people who die for an idea. I don't believe in heroism. I know it's easy, and I've learned it could be murderous. What interests me is living and dying for what one loves. Ryu had been watching the journalist attentively. 
With his eyes still on him, he said quietly, Man isn't an idea, Rambert. Rambert sprang off the bed, his face ablaze with passion. Man is an idea, and a precious small idea, once he turns his back on love. And that's my point. We, mankind, have lost the capacity for love. We must face that fa fact, doctor. Let's to acquire that capacity, or, if it's really beyond us, wait for the deliverance that will come to each of us anyway, without his playing the hero. Personally, I look no farther. Ria rose. He suddenly appeared very tired. You're right, Ramba. Rambert, quite right, and for nothing in the world would I try to dissuade you from what you're going to do. It seems to me absolutely right and proper. However, there's one thing I must tell you. There's no question of heroism in all this. It's a matter of common decency. That's an idea which m may make some people smile, but the only means of fighting a plague is common decency. What do you mean by common decency? Rambert's tone was grave. I don't know what it means for other people, but in my case, I know that it consists in doing my job. Your job? I only wish I, I were sure what my job is. There was a mordant edge to Rambert's voice. Maybe I'm all wrong in putting love first. Ria looked him in the eyes. No, he said vehemently. You are not wrong. Rambert gazed thoughtfully at them. You two, he said. I suppose you've nothing to lose in all this. It's easier that way to be on the side of angels. Ria drained, drained his glass. Come along, he said to Taru. We've work to do. He went out. Taru followed, but seemed to change his mind when he reached the door. He stopped and looked at the journalist. I suppose you don't know that Ria's wife is in a sanatorium a hundred miles or so away. Rambert showed surprise and began to say something, but Taru had already left the room. At a very early hour next day, Rambert rang up the doctor. Would you agree to my working with you until I found some way of getting out of the town? There was a moment's silence before the reply came. Certainly, Rambert. Thanks. And that brings us to the end of part two.